of SoulCon. Uh, as Ariel said, we are the Envisioning Futures and Futurisms, Resistance, Marginalization, and Genre panel. Um, so I'm not going to take up too much time here with me. I'm a fourth year uh, PhD student at UF. Um, I want to focus on the lovely panelists that we have set up for you all today. So just as a quick reminder, if you have any questions for our panelists throughout the panel today, go ahead and type them in the Q&A as soon as you have them. Um, I know uh, from what I've seen, these are going to be really interesting presentations. I'm sure there's going to want be some things you all want to follow up on. Um, and that way we can try to get to as many as possible at the end of the panel. Uh, and as a quick reminder for our panelists, um, Keep your videos and microphones off for the time being, and when I call out your name or after I finish reading your bio, I'm going to ask you to turn them on. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first speaker for today is DRC Charrington. Uh, they are a second year doctoral student in English and Black Disability Studies at The Ohio State University. Uh, they study rhetorical concepts of ableism and Afrofuturism through the medium of audio narratology, which sounds super dope to me personally. Uh, they also have a few forthcoming essays about Black digital podcasting, the communal experience of Black disability, and a cultural critique of Storm of the X-Men as a disabled Black woman, all debuting next year. Uh, their presentation is titled A Black Ghost Made Flesh, Disability and Black Resistance in Spectre AV, uh, and it will be a sampling of their forthcoming Afrofuturist audio project built from their doctoral research. So DRC, I'm going to mute and stop my video and pass the baton to you. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here. If you'll give me one second to start this, so that way it looks proper. Okay. Um, one second. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is DRC Charrington Neal, and my research is in audio narratology or sound stories, which I will be sharing with you during today's presentation on blackness and disability. Um, so, make sure that your volume uh, is up. Um, so first, first off, I'd like to start with a quote. I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood ecto, uh, movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids, and I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. When I considered the genesis of this project, Essentially, I kept coming back to the premise of Afrofuturism. In 1994, Mark Derry coined this term after he wrote that African Americans are, in a very real sense, the descendants of alien abductees. They inhabit a sci-fi nightmare in which unseen but no less impassable force fields of intolerance frustrate their movements, uh, official histories undo what has been done, and technology is too often brought to bear on Black bodies. Essentially, Afrofuturism was designed to say that tomorrow's Black Lives Matter. But now, in the year 2135, in the reimagined city of Neo Orleans, I'm taking it a step further to say that Black disabled lives matter by introducing you all to my Black disabled superhero, Kyrie Diallo. August 20th, 1619, a Portuguese privateer ship known as the White Lion will dock on land in Jamestown, Virginia, bringing 20 African bodies ashore for the first time to the New World. Along with God, brutality, and a new form of capitalism made of bodies, they also will bring the ideology of genetic superiority, which will be ushered into the digital age with the announcement of the Human Genome Project on June 26, 2000.
As a result, the first transhuman specter will be born on July 31st, 2110. And my name is Kyrie Diallo. Good morning, patient. The doctor has been notified and will be attending you shortly. Where am I? What's going on? It is 8.34 a.m. Today is Tuesday, February 24th, 2139, and you are in the intensive care ward of the Apex Treatment Facility, following a voluntary stem cell reconstruction procedure. Why? Why does my head hurt? Everything hurts. The procedure required several samples from your central nervous system, so discomfort is common. Would you like a shot of morphine? Uh. Administering. Please, relax. Thank you. D did you see where they put my things? Your clothes are in the drawer next to your bed, and your hollow deck is next to the light. You currently have two missed calls from your sister. Holodeck power on. Retrieve messages. Video message left yesterday 9.54 p.m. Hey, so how'd it go? Did you cash your check yet? You were supposed to call me back after you finished getting all roided from the study from Morton Labs. You did tell me it wasn't supposed to be an hour, but it's been like three and I'm still waiting. Um, so are we getting dinner or what? You know, call me back. Bye. End of message. Shit. System, can you open a line to the exonet? Subject, Michelle Diallo. Access is denied. Uh, wait, wait, um, try again. Exonet line, Michelle Diallo. Access is denied. What the? Where did you say we were again? And you are in the intensive care ward of the Apex treatment. Yeah, facility. I know. Wait, what is Apex? She said Morton Labs. This isn't Morton. No information available. What? What is that noise? No, no information. What? What does that mean? Where am I? What's going on? Can you turn that noise off? I can't. What kind of morphine is this? System? Where'd you take me? System? System, hello? Oh, shit, not again. Oh. Oh my god. As a specter, Kyrie has the ability to turn into a living ghost, an electromagnetic being that is impervious to harm, who can shape the electric reality of the world to his liking. 
power by Deborah Walker's King concept, um, excuse me, powered by Deborah Walker King's concept of psychic black pain. He is in effect the living embodiment of what W.E.B. Du Bois calls the two worlds of black America. And as a result, experiences a form of temporal distortion that I call glitching, where he is uncontrollably thrown across a timeline of his own black disabled ancestors. It is my way of saying that black disabled people have in fact always existed, but yet Afrofuturism does not include us. It is here that Kyrie rebels against this idea. I wanted a story that like Afrofuturism promises, puts black marginalized bodies at the center in a way that Aliyah Abdul Rahman's, um, that recalls Aliyah Abdul Rahman's idea of the black aesthetic or ways that border on the outrageous, the incredulous, and the fantastic. Inspector, Kyrie is a gay wheelchair using superhero who unlike mainstream depiction was disabled before he got his superpowers and doesn't get out of his seat once. This isn't a story of how great he could be if he lived and moved like everyone else, but instead it's a story of high-speed car chases, frenetic gunfights, and a detective thriller that is born from his real life. In this culture, black, world, or black culture is celebrated in this world, but in a vein of what Simone Brown calls dark Seuss valence, where black communities record the activities of others while being recorded themselves, Neo Orleans has also become Kyrie's worst enemy. As Howard Wynott puts it, it is, often, it is also the often invisible substance that in many ways structures the universe of modernity, but one must ask here, invisible to whom? This ultimately serves as the guiding question for both myself and my character, writing a story about the, the able-bodied unassuming mask of traditional black culture that often grants Kyrie access to safe spaces, but against the threat of disability. Here, the inversion of panoptic embodied police presence has taken on a very real threat in this world of mediated hypervisibility. But as black culture has taught us, what threatens us also protects us. And for the final part of my presentation, I want to leave you with a final teaser of Kyrie's story that takes place after he has broken out of Apex Lab and running into a crowd that is dancing on the night of Carnival, he uses them to hide from both the cops and robotic canine units, making his way into Club Octavia. As you listen, think about the character and imagine that you are Kyrie. That is the idea that I believe that Afrofuturism aspires to and ultimately what it should. Electronic wheelchair activate. Manual mode engaged. We cannot get to your friend's house on foot. I suggest we searching for appropriate linguistic context. Hijack a vehicle. Scanning for electronic override controls. Kyrie, we should go. Head for the back of the market. The alleyway is clear. We will steal that car on your left. One moment. I will drive. Automatic override failure. Please wait. Kyrie, we have a problem. The police are nearing our location. Oh shit. Denied. What the? <laughs> Automatic override failure. Access yes. Ah, 
shoot. Freeze! This is the police! Don't move! Fuck you! are barricading most of the main street. Authorizing auto detour. Kyrie, why are humans so terrible at driving? This traffic is searching for approximate linguistic context. Shit. Please wait. A Korean flying ship is blocking our path. Kyrie, we have a problem. Infrared electronic signals have locked onto our position. Target acquired. What the fuck? Police scanner detected. Please hide. Resuming escape route. Invisibility mode activating. Invisibility mode deactivating. And uh, that is my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you so much, DRC. That was fantastic. I was literally shouting at my screen while it was happening. Um, so excellent. I'm going to ask you to mute and stop your video for the time being, because uh, we are going to move on to our next presentation. Uh, Adrienne Risha is a PhD candidate in the American Studies program at the College of William and Mary. Her research interests include Arab and Muslim representation in American popular media, the superhero genre, and media theory. She is the author of The Blue Age of Comic Books, assistant editor of Comics Academe at the Eisner Award-winning Women Write About Comics, and president of the Graduate Student Caucus of the Comic Studies Deci uh, Society. Uh, her paper today is going to be Brown People with Bad Resumes, Arab and Latinx Ethno-Racial Identities in Green Lantern. So uh, Adrian, could you turn on your camera and mic? And you can go ahead and get started. Just to check, the, is, can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes, I can see. Okay, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, so the superhero genre has made aliens into Americans for, the, for more than 80 years, since Superman debuted in 1938. And it has made Americans into aliens for at least 60 years. In 1959, following World War II, Hal Jordan debuted as Green Lantern, a member of the Green Lantern Corps an intergalactic police force. Following Jordan, Guy Gardner joined the Corps in 1968, John Stewart in 1971, and Kyle Rayner in 1994. With each human addition to the Green Lantern Corps, it has come to represent a greater variety of people, making figurative aliens into Americans. But it has also made Americans into literal aliens by taking them off planet and into outer space. Consequently, the Green Lantern narrative, like the superhero genre at large, can be understood as facilitating both assimilation and alienation. Introduced in 2012 and 2013-2014 under the banner of DC's New 52, Simon Baz and Jessica Cruz are some of the newer members of the Corps. The Lebanese and Muslim American Simon Baz was introduced in the Green Lantern title proper, in which the Mexican and Honduran American Jessica Cruz made a cameo before being formally introduced in Justice League. Following DC's rebirth, the two team up in Green Lantern's 2016 to 2018, which I'll talk more about today. These then rookie Green Lanterns expand the notion of what it means to be and look American while also being alienated from that national identity. Throughout this presentation, keep an eye on the bottom right-hand corner of the slides. Many will have a QR code that can be scanned with the camera of a smartphone or tablet. They'll, if they work, link to books or sites being referenced. 
While Baz and Cruz are initially forced to team up, they eventually come to see each other, not just as teammates, but friends. In writer Tim Seeley and artist Ronan Coquette, Carlo Barberi, and Matt Santarelli's Green Lanterns, Volume 6, A World of Their Own, of Our Own, Cruz describes herself and Baz more than once as, quote, brown people with bad resumes, end quote. I'm going to break this statement into parts and then show how they come together in the narrative. It may be read as a statement of solidarity, offering a shared category of racial identity. The word brown then refers to their ethno-racial identities collectively, collapsing Arab and Latinx together. Categories of race on the US Census include, according to the census.gov language quoted here on the slide, white, inclusive of European, Middle Eastern, and North African people, black or African American, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian and Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander. They do not include brown. Arab, which refers to a particular ethnic group with roots in both the Middle East and North Africa, falls under the umbrella of white, not Asian or African. In spite of this and the fact that most Arab Americans are Christian, Arab has historically been and is often now conflated with Muslim, and both in a post 9-11 United States are popularly understood to be non-white or brown identities. That conflation of ethnic and religious identity results in an ethno-racial identity not unlike Latinx where ethnicity is understood to correspond directly to a race, brown, despite the fact that Latinx people may identify with one or more racial categories on the census. Brown is an alternative to establish racial categories, but it is still one predicated on such categorization rather than the recognition of distinct ethnic identities, which cannot always be made visible. Race in comics is a thing that can be lettered and illustrated and consequently seen. Simon Baz and Jessica Cruz are not only verbally identify as brown, they are both colored in shades of brown, Cruz often in much lighter shades than Baz, although coloring is inconsistent across series and even issues within collected volumes, often depending on the colorist. And I'm going to talk about the work of two colorists later on. According to colorist Mark Chiarello and letterer Todd Klein's The DC Comics Guide to Coloring and Lettering Comics, until the 1970s, comics colorists worked from a palette of 63 colors. In the 1970s, that palette nearly doubled. And in the 1980s, the industry adopted digital coloring, which would have exponentially increased the number of colors that could be printed. This would have also exponentially increased the number of skin tones that could be represented on the page. Chiarella writes that traditionally and digitally, comic book colors are, quote, made up of three basic primary colors or three basic printer's ink colors, yellow, magenta, and cyan, end quote. All colors, except black and white are produced by combining values of these colors, seen on this slide. For the average white face, Chiarella recommends a base color of, as seen on the left, 20% yellow and 20% magenta, which produces a pink. And acknowledging variation, he recommends a base color of, as seen on the right, 65% yellow, 60% magenta, and 45% cyan for black characters. The addition of cyan to increased values of yellow and magenta results in a shade of brown and these two colors are obviously very different. Working from those bases, colorists can adjust values to give characters different complexions. In Green Lanterns, the percentages of yellow, magenta, and cyan used to color the Arab Baz are usually higher than those used to the color the Latina Cruz. On the left, you'll see panels from Green Lanterns number 33. And on the right, there are color squares taken from Baz and Cruz's cheeks, with Baz on the left and Cruz on the right. Although these colors may appear different based on your computer settings, the difference should, between them should still be pretty stark. And then on the left here, you'll see panels from Green Lanterns number 34, the subsequent issue. On the right, there are color squares taken from Baz and Cruz's cheeks again, with Baz on the left and Cruz on the right. The difference is less pronounced, but still obvious. Taken all together as they are here, with Baz still on the left and Cruz on the right, 33 above 34, we can see how race is made through artwork. The values that are used to color Baz's skin are much higher than those used to color Cruz's, but we can consider all of these colors brown as in terms of being shades of skin tones. They are just still very different shades of brown. And then looking back at these panels, which show these Green Lanterns both flying through space, in Green Lanterns, which like the Green Lantern and Justice League comics in which Baz and Cruz originate, you can see that it utilizes a realistic aesthetic in its line work. 
However, it is unlikely that either Baz or Cruz would be physically recognizable as characters of their respective ethnic identities because there are neither skin tones nor phenotypic features by which Arab or Latinx people may be universally identified, to say nothing of individuals who are both. That Baz and Cruz are both colored in shades of brown is meant to show that they are people of color on earth and that they remain people of color even in the absence of white characters who would otherwise provide visual context. In space, surrounded by aliens of different physiologies and sometimes even absent of them, Baz and Cruz are nonetheless marked by racial difference, which is something the reader can see. That they both identify as brown recognizes what they have in common and suggests that they might function as a cohesive racial group, but it fails to recognize their differences, both as representatives of different and already diverse ethnicities and as individuals. The bad resumes part of brown people with bad resumes refers to Baz and Cruz's lives before they became ring bearers. In writer Jeff Johnson, artist Doug Monkey's Green Lantern 2011 to 2016, following a flashback to 9-11, Baz attempts to steal a van. As he drives, police cars follow, and he realizes that the van contains a live bomb. He drives the van to the empty Dearborn Auto Factory from which he was laid off, where it explodes. Baz is then arrested and sent to Guantanamo Bay as an accused terrorist, where, while he is being interrogated, a corrupted Green Lantern ring chooses him and breaks him out. Baz's origin story is intimately connected to both his ethnic and religious identities as an Arab and Muslim man. At the end of the end, this volume in which Baz's origin story appears, it is said that he will be responsible for training the first human woman to become a Green Lantern, Jessica Cruz. In writer Johns and artist Monkey and Jason Fabok's Justice League 2011 and 2016, Cruz's ring from an alternate dimension, because comics, comes to her while she's locked in her Portland apartment. Four years prior, Cruz was on a hunting trip with friends when they witnessed men burying a body. The men killed her friends, but Cruz managed to escape. She subsequently experiences agoraphobia, what the American Psychiatric Association defines as, quote, the fear of being in situations where escape may be difficult or embarrassing, end quote. Her ring is attracted to that fear rather than an ability to overcome it. Cruz's origin story, unlike Baz's, has nothing to do with her ethnic or religious identities. When, in Green Lanterns, Baz and Cruz go looking for jobs, Cruz's difficulty with securing gainful employment and her civilian identity has more to do with the gaps in her resume than who she is or what religion she practices. And so going back to Green Lanterns number 33, Cruz looks whitewashed with fair skin and light brown hair. She appears in stark contrast to Baz, who is not anywhere near white passing, which you'll see on the next slide. At an interview for a waitressing position, she is asked about the four years during which she did not work. Cruz is honest, although she shouldn't have to be. She says, quote, I witnessed a crime, a serious one. It triggered agoraphobia and a panic disorder, end quote. The interviewer says in response that waitressing can be demanding. Meanwhile, Baz, at his own interview, admits that he used to street race and has a criminal record from doing so. He continues, quote, it's not just that. I boosted this van once. Turns out it was full of explosives. I'm Muslim. The cops made an assumption. I was exonerated. But if you look me up, you'll see the newspapers. You'll see the word terrorist. In the following issue, number 34, Cruz's skin color changes, and she gets a job, but not as a waitress. Instead, in what might generously be characterized as an accommodation, she is asked to work in the kitchen. Still, it is a foot in the door, and Cruz later asks her manager to be moved out of the kitchen and into the dining area. Baz, likewise, appears in a different shade of brown, but he does not get the job for which he applied. The interviewer says, quote, with your record, well, it doesn't matter whether you had any part in terrorism or not. It's just like you said, my guys look you up, they see that word, end quote. The interviewer does not believe that Baz will be able to assimilate into the work crew and does not give him the opportunity to try. Later in the same issue, Baz, smiling after having evacuated aliens from a dying planet, jokes to Cruz, quote, not bad for a guy who can't get a job, huh? End quote. He continues, quote, I was overqualified anyway, but that's what sucks about all this, right? I mean, the Guardians hired us to be super cops, entrusted with a weapon that can do just about anything we damn well please to protect all this. On Earth, I can't even get a gig flipping tires. But Baz and Cruz aren't really super cops. While even in Green Lanterns, members of the Corps will sometimes function as police officers, they are, or at least have the capacity to be, more than that. In a world of our own, Baz and Cruz help relocate the alien refugees they saved. This is closer to social work than policing. 
When Cruz responds to Baz, she references the Green Lantern Oath, quote, out here were beings who overcame great fear to battle back evil's might with emerald light, no matter how bright the day or how dark the night. Back home were two brown people with bad resumes, end quote. And this is where the phrase first appears. In space, they're Green Lanterns before they're people of color or even human, but that doesn't change the colors of their skin. On Earth, they're reducible to a racial category in words on paper. Brown people with bad resumes emphasizes what they have in common, but at the same time, it eludes their differences. Cruz uses the phrase again after she and Baz help settle tensions between the refugees and the citizens of the planet on which they were resettled. Baz, looking at a statue of Aben Sur, the alien Green Lantern whose ring Hal Jordan inherited, says to Cruz, quote, question for you, Cruz. What would we be if this guy hadn't accidentally landed on Earth, if he hadn't passed his ring to Hal, if Hal hadn't stuck you and me together, end quote. Cruz replies, quote, hmm, well, I guess we'd be two brown people with bad resumes. And then on the next page, which isn't shown here, she continues, but we'd both be staring up at the sky, wondering if there were a better world out there somewhere, end quote. Green Lanterns doesn't offer an answer to the question of whether or not there's a better world out there somewhere, but its Green Lantern narrative does enable its creators to expand on the notion of what it means to be and look American in this world by featuring the Lebanese and Muslim American Simon Baz and the Mexican and Honduran American Jessica Cruz as its title characters. It has them claim a racial category that encompasses their respective ethno-racial identities, but it also privileges that racial identity over individual and cultural difference. In doing all of this, it does what the superhero genre at large does. It facilitates both assimilation and alienation, sometimes in overlapping ways and sometimes in ways that contradict each other. These processes, like American identity, are complex and multifaceted. So too are superheroes and the comic books in which they appear. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much for that really interesting presentation. Um, you touched on a lot of things that I think are uh, a lot of points that are part of kind of our cultural consciousness right now about art in comics specifically. So excellent, thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker to keep us moving uh, is Kedra V. Taylor, who is a second year PhD student at the University of Connecticut. Uh, she is studying black girlhood in American literature and will be talking about one of my personal favorite novels in her piece, The Dark Fantastic in Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, inscribed Black Girlhood into Imagined National Futures. So Kidra, if you could turn on your camera and mic, I'm going to pass the baton to you. Hi folks. Let me do the old people techie stuff here. Okay, um, I won't be reading directly from my paper um, for two reasons. Uh, one is it's not done yet. And two, because you'll be able to read the finished product in a special issue of the Pacific Coast Philology coming later this year. Insert shameless plug here. So today I'll give you a skinny version of my future work. Parable of the Sower was written by Octavia Butler and published in 1993. For this essay, I'm using the graphic novel adaptation by Damian Duffy and John Jennings, published in 2020, for um, primarily because it's a beautiful piece of work to handle and because it helps us, the images helps us to connect to the, the, the person of color in, at the center of the text. The novel follows 15 year old Lauren Olamina through three years of her life during a chaotic America for, from the year 2024 to 2027. During this time, Lauren experiences loss, violence, love, and then she begins her journey to find fertile ground for planting earth seed. Earthseed is neither a church nor a religion. It is a belief system, according to Lauren, that relies on the notion that God is change. On her journey, she must shed much of her old self in order to survive, so she undergoes a transformation that prepares her for what is to come. She must make choices about who she will be and how she will exist in a rapidly crumbling society that has already counted her out of the number of survivors. So early in the text, Lauren says, seeds have no ability at all to travel great distances under their own power, and yet they do travel. Even they don't sit in one place and wait to be wiped out. Lauren goes on to say, I am earth seed. 
Now this moment foreshadows Lauren's plan to strike out on her own as she begins to understand herself and her place in the world. Earthseed is grounded in her belief that it is up to each of us to shape God rather than wait for change to simply happen to us. In the end, Lauren believes the way to survive the chaos of, of her crumbling nation is to plant Earthseed. While much of the scholarship about Parable of the Sower does grapple with notions of race, gender, and social injustices depicted in the novel, and while this same scholarship identifies the dystopian or utopian tendencies in the work, not enough emphasis is placed on the fact that Lauren Olamina is only 15 years old and leading the charge to realize this imagined society that is Earthseed. This is especially important when we think about the historical subjugation of Black female bodies in the United States, despite the constant protests calling for equity and justice. As Joshua D. puts it, Black women and girls accrue among the highest costs for confronting America's sins, but they're also excluded from and silenced in narratives about the national reckoning. In other words, Black girls are not expected to speak against their subjectivity. They're expected to wait for change to just happen to them. So it's especially interesting to read in Butler's novel, a Black adolescent character who is cast as the heroine, but she is still subjugated to dark otherness by nature of her Black femaleness. When we consider the national casting of Black bodies in America's story as stereotypically monstrous others, we very clearly see that Lauren's story is different. In the age of We Need Diverse Books, we've come to understand the importance of young Black girls needing to see themselves represented, represented in a body of literature. Rudine Sims Bishop gives us the metaphor, mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors to put into perspective the ways in which literature functions in the classroom. Stephanie Renee Tolliver explains that the point of the metaphor was to acknowledge the limited, small, or broken mirrors that marginalized children, that marginalized children were often forced to look through as they searched for themselves in the literature. But it was also a way to highlight the opaque or boarded do windows and locked doors that formed when there were misrepresentations or omissions of specific groups. Tolliver's synthesis of Sim's metaphor helps us better understand the role of representations in the literature that young people read. In Butler's depiction of Lauren's character, a black girl protagonist who quickly adapts as she means to survive is an important point of discussion when considering the role of black girlhood in literature. The stereotypical depictions of black girls have caused damage. These representations have created a myth around black girls' identities that aim to disarm them. So Butler's story is effective when Lauren rejects the notion that she is a victim of a white-centric God and his nation, and what's more is that she imagines herself in a new society that values her identity as she comes to realize her imagined society, imagines, comes to realize her, her imagined society by the end of the story. Ultimately, I'm arguing in this project that Butler's work through its inscription of Black girls into the rebuilding of a nation offers futures where Black girls' windows and mirrors are expanded. Now, we begin this discussion with um, Lauren's rejection of her father's God. She tells us in the first few pages of the graphic novel that she has nightmares that are probably triggered by her struggle to be her father's daughter, and that at least three years ago, her father's God stopped being her God. Now, there are a couple of inter interesting things that I'd like to point out in Lauren's journal entries so early in the story. The first is that just three years ago, Lauren was only 12. So how many of you can say that you made such a huge philosophical leap at 12? This is not to say that a 12 year old couldn't make this move, but I would argue that it's a pretty big step towards adulthood to say the least. The other thing is that she doesn't say that she was curious about her father's God. She says her father's God stopped being her God. Here, she isn't denouncing the existence of a Christian God, but she's rejecting her father's God, a God that he is he and his ancestors probably inherited from, from the colonization of America. This inherited God is, as we've often been told, is white and male. This God is the God of the Bible, which means he is the, so the savior in the Bible who, according to some who supported slavery, cursed be the Canaanites and all of that. So Lauren's rejection of him in favor of one who, of a God who, who judges her on her own merit is pretty significant to her ability to see herself as one who has the autonomy to challenge oppressive social systems that keep her on a downward path of mobility. 
Lauren also writes in her journal that her God has another name. In her critique of her father's God, she says, my favorite statement on my father's God and on God's in general is the book of Job. God playing with people like my younger brother played with their toy soldiers. Bang, wipe out all the toys family, give it a new one. Who cares what the toys think? If they're yours, you make the rules. Now Lauren's sarcasm here is indicative of her frustration with her own experiences and those of the families in her gated community. When we compare this God to the God of Earthseed, we see God who adapt, we see a God who adapts and learns with their followers. This God, unlike the Christian God, is a partner in a great change who finds victims only in those who are afraid or short-sighted. And since she writes in her journal, we are Earthseed, we all have the potential for greatness and a bright future inspired by change, which is exactly the opposite of how we black girls are cast in America. Earthseed is the clearest example of Lauren's reimagining of herself in a country whose doctrines were written to subjugate her for the purpose of advancing white privilege in America. She begins to imagine herself beyond the walls and even beyond the Los Angeles city limits because although they are meant to keep her safe, according to her father, she sees those boundaries as, um, that's, as, sti as stifling her growth and change. The walls of the compound, like the boundaries of the social systems, inhibit Lauren's potential to be anyone other than her father's daughter. And all that comes with that, mis that particular misidentification. As Lisbeth Grant Britton aptly points out, Lauren struggles not to be demoralized by this system. Instead, she tries to use it as a catalyst for change. Lauren takes what she's learned from her education, from her parents, and even from church, and she imagines a future where she is free to be herself in whatever way she ultimately defines it. One of the things that I'm grappling with right now with this project as I come, come to the end of it um, is how to make sense of Lauren's embodiment of the dark other as it's defined by Ebony Elizabeth Thomas's work, The Dark Fantastic. In her work, Thomas addresses the imagination gap that makes it hard for so many authors and their readers, to, according to Toni Morrison in Playing in the Dark, to imagine a character like Lauren Olamina, a Black female protagonist who is a hero. What was very complicated about this situation is that she is cast as a hero, but she still embodies the, the, the dark other because she is Black. Um, Thomas's work uses critical race theory to examine the complex in intricacies of how we understand the dark other in popular culture. So she identifies the dark fantastic cycle, or she being um, Dr. Thomas, um, identifies the dark fantastic cycle as the transformation that the dark other embodies over the course of their story. There's the spectacle because she is dark, hesitation, her presence is unsettling. Um, there's violence that the dark other experiences because that results in her death of transformation. There's the haunting. Um, she has a continuing presence throughout the narrative. Now, all of these are true for Lauren as, we, as she moves through the narrative. Um, the, the final um, step in the, the dark fantastic cycle, as Thomas, can, Thomas contends, is the final step um, which is the emancipation. And it is reached only when the dark other is liberated from the spectacle, embodied hesitation, violence, and haunting. Now, I believe Butler's Parable of the Sword illustrates this complexity, and this is the part of the puzzle that I have to figure out, um, or I'm just gonna cut it out before it gets to the editors. Thanks for your time. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I actually haven't read the graphic novel version of this yet, so it's kind of exciting to see clips that you were posting there. Um, okay, so I'm gonna ask that you mute your mic and your camera, and I'm gonna start with our final presentation of this panel. Um, Dr. Jonathan Kincaid obtained his PhD in English from UCLA last fall, where he studied and wrote a dissertation on digital media, film, and narrative theory. His fiction on the themes of trauma, sexuality, and Blackness have been featured in FIA Literary Magazine of Black Speculative Fiction, Anathema, Spec from the Margins, and elsewhere. He writes to give Black folks chances to see ourselves represented honestly and with unflinching complexity. So Dr. Kincaid, I'm gonna ask you to turn on your camera and your mic and I will 
turn the floor over to you. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Ayani. Um, like Kedra's presentation, uh, mine will also not be from a paper, but uh, I am going to be sharing a, uh, a comic of mine uh, that if you could please drop the link to that in the chat, Ayani. Um, it's an interactive uh, multimodal comic, uh, and I'll give you the chance to take a look at that while I say a little bit about the context uh, that inspired the comic. Um, and I'd also like to talk about the um, sort of the craft concerns and some of the ideas that went into it as I, as I made it. But it, it is also a forthcoming work, so it's, it's not complete, but um, I hope you uh, enjoy what is there. Uh, so I'd like to start by talking a little bit about the context uh, for this comic itself, which came out of my own research on um, multimodal interactive storytelling, especially storytelling that relies on adaptation and remediation. Um, my dissertation focused largely on the relationship between 20th century media and video games and the narrative tropes that video games gleaned from 20th century media, um, but also, also adversely the tropes that 21st century media are looking to video games for um, now that that is a sort of common popular form that is a, a part of everyday storytelling now. Uh, this project also came out of um, my engagement with narrative theory, uh, which is only just now considering race as a formal structure of narrative experience, which uh, is, is sort of odd. Um, Sean, I will say that the, the page may take a, a moment to load. Um, so just give it a second and if it doesn't load, um, we can, yeah. Um, but it, it sort of seems odd and I'm sure it seem, may seem, maybe seems odd to, to a lot of you that uh, you know, if race is such a grounding uh, experience of the world, uh, that it is only just now being considered a, a formal aspect of narrative. Uh, and I'm sort of working here with Blake Wilder's observation that quote, separate racial worlds influence aspects of narrative, but at the same time, it is narrative that creates those segregated worlds. And so, you know, I was wondering about the metaphysical categories of, of narrative logic and why that couldn't also be organized around um, the, the racial experiences that, that we have. Um, the project also came out of, of course, my own personal love for comics and was a, a sort of unabashed attempt to learn the programming language and software necessary for more complex projects. Uh, it was done in a game design software known as Unity uh, with an API uh, that is known as Panoply. Um, which is uh, uh, was developed by a digital comics artist named Eric Lawyer. Uh, so the, the project itself gets name from uh, a folktale of the same name, which it adapts. Uh, and it's a short folktale that is about a black couple that is driving along on a road on a, on a, on a dour rainy day, or excuse me, rainy night, um, and decide to seek shelter and they come across this house. And when they, they the, the story mentions specifically that the couple uh, goes to the back door of the house. And I'm sure those of you that are, that are historically grounded know that that is a, a pretty significant detail. Um, and they encounter uh, a headless figure. And the woman of the couple uh, asks, uh, you know, what in Lord's name do you want? And that ends up being a spell that enables this headless figure to tell its story. Uh, which is a very brief story that I had a head and now I don't have a head and it's buried in the basement. And it gives this couple the task of um, reuniting the body with the head and ultimately uh, decides that it will reward them with the house and, and its, its riches and that's sort of the end of the story. And that's it. Um, I was really interested in the adaptive quality of folktales uh, because folktales themselves are all about adaptation, uh, especially when you think of the oral nature of storytelling and the way that the oral quality of folktales can change over time. Um, this particular iteration comes from the annotated African American folktales, which was edited by uh, Maria uh, Tater and Henry Louis Gates Jr. Um, and that version itself was sourced from the Federal Writers Project uh, of the United States Works Project Administration. Um, and so even rewrites of this folktale can be different. The, the, the book itself includes a lot of different versions. I was able to track down a lot of different versions of 
for instance, one that was rewritten by James Haskins. Uh, and so I am really invested in the idea of what happens when we remediate that adaptation uh, to, to a new form. Um, I'm also interested in the deceptively simple logic of folktales um, because it pushes against the idea that stories have to be logocentric. Um, and I think that's something that you encounter a lot in say creative writing uh, programs that are teaching ideas about like writing what you know. Um, and the, I like the simple ending of this folktale in which everything works out for its black characters, but still falls into um, the, the genre of horror. Um, as a horror writer myself, uh, I use horror to reckon with the world around us. Um, I, this comic itself also is an attempt to push back against the idea that black horror is a new thing. Um, it, it has a long legacy that includes Octavia Butler and Tenena Reed Du. Um, but you know, with films like Get Out and uh, Lovecraft Country, um, you know, it's sort of like people are in this place where it's like, oh wow, black black people write horror too. Um, but it has a, a legacy that goes back to folk tales which use horror to make sense of our experience in the US since our ancestors were brought here during the Middle Passage. So, the, but what we do know today though, um, is that the popular media of the genre of horror and you know, the examples that readily pop into people's minds have generally not been kind to black and brown bodies. Um, I'm sure that we could ramble off a litany of, of tropes that uh, sort of exemplify that idea. And so this comic was also an attempt to capitalize on these tropes and to also subvert them by relying on them. Um, and there I'm thinking of um, the philosopher Nelson Goodman's idea that new worlds are made from quote, worlds already on hand. Um, and so the, the process was all done digitally for this comic. Um, the art was drawn in a program called Krita. Uh, and then I then uh, sliced the images for each panel. Um, Ayani, hopefully you could um, share the static version of the comic and you'll notice that there are some differences between the static version and the interactive version. And so in, in a way, this comic is an adaptation of an adaptation that gets remediated. Um, I then used these design assets to um, think about the interplay between text, sound, and the timed sequence delivery of the, the artwork. Uh, that, that part, that last part being a really pivotal um, component of the way that the horror here is functioning. Uh, because for me, horror is all about suspense and dread more so than it is about uh, say graphic depictions of violence or anything like that. Um, and so there were a lot of concerns for me about how the uh, page is organized visually, which is um, something that comic artists uh, I've spoken to and I've, I've um, researched are generally um, really concerned with, you know, there's for instance, reveals in modern comics often come with with a, with the page turn, so that when the reader goes from a, you know the left page to the right page, and then you turn the page, um, there's a, a sort of surprise on the next page, and so it simulates surprise in this really fantastic way. That I thought the digital medium would be a really great way to um, to embellish. Um, the time delay itself is, was was an attempt to uh, underscore the dread of what comes next. Um, and that is especially uh, tied to readers' expectations of what comes next in horror stories for Black characters. Uh, I thought it was really important to, um, to play off of that, that established expectation to then sort of turn it on its head. Because as I said, popular media sort of gives us the expectation that bad things will happen to Black folks in horror media. And um, I really want to push back, you know, my, all of my body of work is, is, a, is an attempt at pushing back against that idea. 
Um, this particular narrative, uh, even though it's unfinished, uh, has a happy ending for the characters. Um, and it has a resolution for the ghostly headless figure, uh, not necessarily a happy ending, but the black characters encounter with that headless figure who is also black, even though the original story does not at all mention whether that character was black. Uh, that, that was a sort of a, a, a writerly liberty that I took with that to sort of model uh, black folks own engagement with history and a past that is often more horrific than the monsters of genre fiction. Uh, and that's all I have for you today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Kincaid. Uh, so I'm going to ask all of our panelists to turn their microphones and cameras on, because uh, we actually have a nice chunk of time here to do some Q&A. Uh, so first and foremost, thank you all of you for your fantastic presentations and panels. Um, if we were live, I'm sure you guys would hear thunderous applause for all of the great work that you've done. Uh, so why don't we go ahead and dive into some of the Q&A. Um, there's actually a few questions for everyone. Uh, so DRC, why don't we start with you? There's an interesting question here about um, audio and audio experience. Uh, so this is from JM Hunter. Uh, what was the experience like trying to evoke blackness or color and disability into an audio sensory experience that you have planned for listeners? Helping the audience make these connections, was it difficult, easy, liberating, confusing? Uh, and to tap on that, I would love to hear a bit about your process of creation here, like finding voice actors, um, you know, sound effects, putting it all together, etc. Um, so I'm just take the cop-out answer and say all of the above. Um, <laughs> it, it, uh, it, I mean, for me, I think that's one of the most challenging parts about this project, but also one of the most interesting. Um, I hate Audible. I absolutely hate Audible. And I hate the fact that it's just people reading text at you. That's not a story. Like, I want to live it. I want to be in it. Make me feel like it's GoPro for my face. And so... I, that's the kind of work that I want to do, and I just feel like Audible is this multi-million dollar corporation that's just scamming folks uh, on, on some laziness. Um, and so when I do the work that I do, being blackity black, black is super intentional. So most of my voice actors, if not all of them, 95% of them are people of color, um, you know, and, and basically I just do digital manipulation through audition, through Adobe Audition. Um, the work that I do is I think the technical term, the narratologist technical term is bricolage, uh, mm. intertextual bricolage. And so it's a website that I use that where I collect random sounds from every day. People, you know, recording the flush of a toilet or the sound of a bike chain. And then I have to manipulate it in a way that makes it real. Um, and so that was probably the hardest concept about this is imagining an entire world and an entire city that does not exist. Um, mm. That's also why I included a an illustrator and I have, I have him drawn up some artwork for my project because I was just like, you know, it's not a visual project. And that's really specific to me. I wanted it to be something that was more immersive than reading on a page. Uh, and so this is the midway point between watching a movie and being in one. Excellent, no, thank you very much. And I will say just from that bit, I feel like what you're going for is a success because just like a movie, I was literally yelling at the screen going, oh no, and things like that. So. Thank you very much for that. Um, so moving along, uh, Adrian, I actually have a few questions for you. Um, so do you ever see white identifying characters surrounded by aliens suggested as the minority? Um, and then the commenter said, I feel like comics often use this idea to skirt around the idea of needing to have actual black brown humans. Yeah, um, that happens a lot. It started happening in the 60s with Hal Jordan, um, as well as uh, Ramsey Fawaz writes about this in The New Mutants with comic book cosmopolitics. This idea that you could take an all white family like the Fantastic Four, put them in space, and then explore difference, racial difference largely, with aliens. Mm -hmm. um, and to him, that, that I, I, I disagree with him. I don't think it's enough to have white folks go to space and interact with aliens and, and explore racial difference when we have brown folks who can do that and are alienated and, and you know, 
th there's so many other ways to explore that while also explicitly representing people with marginalized identities. Um, so yes, there's a long history of, you know, white folks experiencing a kind of racial difference as superheroes operating in outer space. But that also, you know, that changes in 1971 with Jon Stewart joining the Green Lantern Corps. And so especially from them, and I think a lot about the work of Adila Funama when I think about um, all of the Green Lantern stuff, but particularly his work on Jon Stewart in Super Black, uh, that there's, you know, also the opportunity to have black and brown folks go to space and explore difference as well as having them do it here on Earth. Um, Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, and you know what? Let's just keep going in order of the panel here. Uh, Kidra, how do you think Lauren's second identity as a disabled woman complicates the way you read her? Um, that's a really interesting question that I was actually just talking with a colleague of mine who actually works in dis uh, on disability studies. Um, we were just talking about that the other day. I'm still grappling with it, but um, my knee-jerk reaction is to say that it's intimately, intimately connected to her nurturing in SOAR and also in her mothering and talents. Um, I see her, her hyper-empathy as sort of a superpower um, where, she give, where it gives her the skills that she needs to survive once she leaves the compound. Um, and I, and I hope I'm not offending anyone by calling it a superpower. This is one of the ways that I help my own ch my children and myself kind of think about the, the way that the world classifies us as disabled. I was like, there's nothing dis about me, so what do you mean? Um, so I, I like to think of it as a thing that helps us to see the world in a different way. And I think that that's what happens with Lauren as well in the story. Um, I think that it's, it also played, I think that her hyper empathy along with her ability to um, just move between genders. Those are things that help her to survive as she's on this journey because when she sets off in, in SOAR, she faces a lot of dangers and she's very aware of that. And I feel like it's her hyper empathy and, uh, that, and, and what she's been, the, the things that she's been thinking about um, at 15 mm -hmm. um, that helps her to navigate that, that tumultuous and traumatic terrain. Um, I think it informs her consciousness and it's sort of a, um, a, a way, a thing that helps her to um, form her decision making, which is at the core of Earthseed. And I think that it's kind of infectious too because the other people play along mm -hmm. once they adopt the, the philosophy of Earthseed. I hope that wasn't rambling too much. No, no, that was fantastic, thank you. Um, and then for Jonathan, uh, where do you think Walker's concept that says, oh, excuse me, what, uh, no, where do you think Walker's concept that says that black art is made from black pain, or what do you think of that? Uh, is it possible to produce black horror that doesn't use blackness? Uh, and kind of tacking on my own question with that, I was wondering if you could speak a bit more about how you're playing with the language of horror um, and multimodal horror specifically and how that does intersect with conversations about blackness being black and existing in different kinds of horror perhaps. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think that the, the idea that, um, that everything has to be rooted in, in pain is, is a sort of myopic perspective on, on black horror. I don't think that you have to root that experience in blackness so much as that is an everyday place that we can locate horror that is is sort of grounded um, not in in fictional monsters but in the monsters that are that are around us, um, whether that be um, sort of overt racism or, or the systemic racism that is sort of more insidious in this kind of spectral way that I think haunts haunts things. Um, but I would say no, that I think that it's it's very much possible to explore issues of, of horror that have nothing to do with quote unquote the, the blackness of, of the characters mm. involved. Um, but when it comes to sort of the multimodal perspectives on on black blackness and horror, I think that the um, the interactive component, you know, I, I love interactivity because it gives you an opportunity to um, 
for lack of a better word, um, a fa- sort of a facsimile in- inhabitants of, of someone else. Mm. Um, you know, I'm thinking of all of the games, you know, DRC and I have talked a lot about uh, the different video games that have impacted us so much. Uh, and I'm thinking about the ways that you, you know, there are a lot of great indie games, like there's a, a great game called um, Bat Dragon Cancer. Uh, and you are inhabiting the experience of um, this, this uh, mother who has cancer and the, the sort of emotional toll that it takes on her to know that she is going to leave her family. Um, and I'm not at all saying that, um, that you're getting a, a, a one-to-one connection of what that individual's experience is like, but I do think that interactivity challenges us to make decisions as other people mm. to then hopefully think a little bit more critically about what that lived experience is like and what inhabiting certain bodies or spaces is like. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so let's bounce back up the list. Uh, Adrian, there's another question for you. Uh, this one's a little long, so I'm going to try to get the important bits here. Um, Vincent Haddad uh, wants to know if you find any difference uh, that you may have noticed between the representations in form colorism and content between a Lebanese American like Simon Boz created by Lebanese American writer Geoff Johns um, who uh, Haddad notes uh, would be unsure if they would or he would identify himself as brown uh, and Kamala Khan a Pakistani American. Uh, He wonders if there's a different valence in the American imagination of Middle Eastern Arab identity pertaining to Lebanon more liberal Europeanized uh, versus Pakistan that surfaces in these comics if at all. So Jeff Johns doesn't, he, he's Lebanese American, but he actually does not identify as Arab American, whereas I am likewise Lebanese American and also identify as Arab American. Uh, and that's a choice that he, he makes and I make, and, but it has obviously political balances. Um, so, and we are both also, we both have European American parents. So there, there's a lot at play in that his identity. Um, when he was working on Simon Baz, he consulted with the Arab American Museum in Dearborn. Detroit, um, in Michigan. Uh, so he also, he went and found help for that. Um, but one of the big differences between h- him and Kamal Khan, Kamal Khan is often colored much more uh, uh, consistently. Uh, there is one colorist who works on all of Ms. Marvel and that helps um, establish her racial identity, which is also much less ambiguous than Simon Baz's. So to be Pakistani American is to be South Asian American is to be Asian American. Whereas in American popular media, to be Middle Eastern is to be this racially ambiguous thing because we don't fit into established racial categories. We're legally white because of a history of needing to be white to become citizens. But, you know, especially after 9-11, we're not treated as white. And so that comes into play in the way that Simon Baz never looks white. There is no opportunity for him to pass as white. And that is part of this idea that Arabs are not white and therefore cannot look white, which is, I mean, if you look at me, obviously that is not true. Uh, But also because our references for what Arab folks look like are often South Asian and Latinx folks because Arabs don't play Arabs on TV. So all of these things come into play where then you have Simon Baz um, often gets mistaken for being of other races if you don't specifically know that he's Lebanese, whereas Ms. Marvel is, you know, we know that she's Pakistani, we know she's South Asian, we, these things are not contestable based at least on the way that she looks because the way she looks is always consistent and because there are, I mean, likewise, you can't, there are no phenotypic features by which any ethnic identity can be universally identified. But Kamala Khan also has phenotypic markers often. Fans are really quick to point out when her nose is not drawn the way that they think it should be based on the fact that she's Pakistani. Uh, there's nothing that we can do with that with Simon Baz because there's no, there, there, there's just no one way to be Arab at all um, because it's such a diverse group of people across, you know, from 22 nation states across two continents that are at the intersections of, you know, everything. Uh, so that's a little bit of how it plays out, but that's also just, that's definitely something I'm thinking about because I write about both of these characters in my dissertation. Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so since we've got about five minutes left, uh, there's a question here for the entire panel. 
Um, where would you like to see comics and graphic novels go from here? What happens next? What should happen versus what is likely to happen? Uh, would anybody like to jump on that one first? Um, I mean, I know, like, for me, the biggest thing that I want um, is I, I, <laughs> I want more disability representation. And I know that that probably sounds very selfish, but, but it's literally almost one fourth of planet Earth. <laughs> It's the biggest minority that transcends all races, all colors, all sexualities, all genders, and yet it almost is never visible. And when it is, it um I think superhero superhero dumb is guilty of overriding disability in a way that makes it fantastic. And so so this is my main issue. For example, this is why I have a piece coming out about the X Men because that entire world, every single mutant in that universe is a disabled person and they would all be categorized and covered under the ADA. But that is not something that people talk about or, or, or you know, notice at all. So that's what I want. Ooh, fantastic. Uh, would anyone else like to jump in? Yeah, Keija. I, I, I'm not, I'm thinking of this question not so much in the production of the work because I feel like you all, do a fantastic job of crit critiquing and influencing mm -hmm. and all of that. That is not my wheelhouse, I admit it. Uh, but what I would like is to see more comics and graphic novels in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Make these texts accessible to young people, teach them how to engage with them because everybody's not gonna be a person who's gonna read a, a, a long novel, okay? give these children whatever whatever medium they need in order to engage with the world give it to them comics and graphic novels is a medium that allows young people to engage in critical conversations that are happening all around them why are we discriminating mm. no excellent fantastic uh yeah i actually am friends with a lot of teachers in uh, middle school and elementary school and they are starting to put comics in the classroom which i think is fantastic um but anyone else uh Jonathan, um, uh, Adrian, yeah. Oh, nope, Jonathan, I've talked a lot. Jonathan, go ahead. Okay. Oh, are you sure? I, I actually was going to make a point uh, in relation to, to, to your presentation and, and one of your points, um, especially as a fan of DC and Marvel Comics. Um, you know, I would love to see more uh, Black colorists uh, and artists, but specifically colorists. Um, and I'm thinking of a, a conversation that Again, another conversation that DRC and I have, because we have so many conversations that like impact me. Um, and we were talking about the show Insecure and the fact that the, the lighting in that show does, uh, right? it's, it's great, it's won awards for it, right? It, it, and it, but there are specific concerns that went into that show that, the, that Issa Rae and a lot of the other creators, Larry Wilmore, the producers, the, the people who were working on that show had a lot of knowledge about the, the needs of, of shooting black folks and so, you know, by that same same uh, vein, I would I would love to see more consistently drawn um, black folks who um, take up that space and are also created by those same folks. Yeah, no, that's that's excellent. Um, and it's got me thinking about a lot of my Twitter feed right now is uh, participating. It's not quite October yet, but are kind of doing black versions of a lot of popular characters in fan art, and I am loving it. Like, I saw a version of Eustace and Mariel from Courage the Cowardly Dog, and I was like, oh, that's she's wearing a bonnet. That's me when I'm in my 70s. Oh, I feel that. So excellent, excellent. And Adrian, would you like to pop in here uh, as we round out the end of our panel? Yeah. Um, this goes back to what Jonathan was saying about creators. Uh, I want to see, this is for me personally, as an Arab American, I want to see more Middle Eastern and North African creators. It can't just be Saladin Ahmed shouldering all of that in, in, across DC and Marvel. Um, but also, particularly as an Arab American woman, I really want my own superhero. Uh, there are no Arab women Amer who are who are superheroes and American and I and you know I write about affective economics in the blue age of comic books and I realized that it would just be me asking you know Marvel and DC to make me spend money but I am willing to do that <laughs> I want my own superhero I want to be able to get an action figure of her please give me that excellent fantastic uh, and we are at the very very end of our panel so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drop all of our panelists socials and contact information in the chat but would you guys like to briefly tell people where they can reach you if they want to know more about you or get more of your work um, we can go in panel order so DRC why don't you start 
Sure. Um, my Twitter feed is uh, DRC uh, Charrington, spelled like a chair, um, C H A I R I N G T O N. And then my Facebook is my name, uh, DRC Charrington Neal. All right, excellent. Adrian. My Twitter is at Adrian Risha, uh, spelled the same way you can see it on Zoom. And my website is adrianrisha.com if you want to find more links to everything. Fantastic. Kedra. Um, my Twitter is at like the at symbol, a black lotus at Twitter. And, um, I can get this right. At a black lotus, B L A Q U E L O T U S. Um, on Facebook, I'm Kedra Burston Taylor, and on Instagram, um, at a, not a notorious bookworm. All right, and last but not least, Jonathan. Uh, you can find more of my work at my website, which is jkincade.com. And both my Twitter and Instagram are at Minus Times. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, now I'm going to pass the baton one final time to our next moderator, Andre Williams. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. And actually, I'll see you again in like two minutes.